here we are for part two of our chat with uh, Bart Campolo. You'll all agree, part one was amazing. Um, and I think that part two, I reckon we can just keep stepping it up because it's it's been wonderful just to hear some of these insights from Bart. So we're ready to um, to kick off. So over to you. I did a dialogue once with an evangelical, like, you know, so one of these apologetic organizations that brought me in, you know, and the, and the other guy was a guy named Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell's son. These, these guys are very well-known apologists here in the United States. I just think it's hilarious that Tony Campolo's son is debating Josh McDowell's son. Did you get Franklin Graham in to bring you drinks? Oh, I know them all. I know them all. Frankie Schaefer would have been there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Jay Baker is another buddy of mine. Um, always son. <laughs> Sean and I had this, it was like a thousand evangelical Christians, Sean and me, and we're talking. And we had this, you know, and you know me, I got, I, I love these people. I, I understand where they're coming from. I, I, I speak the language. And so it's not a debate. I'm not trying to like, I'm just, you know, I'm just telling my story and answering questions and going back and forth. And at the end of it, the guy who organized it said, our people love you. They think you're great. They, they, they've never met a humanist as nice as you. He said, you're the one I'm afraid of. He said, when those other guys come in, when Richard Dawkins comes in and says Christianity is a poison, it's easy to dismiss them. But he said, our whole deal is premised on the fact that, with, that without the love of God, you can't live a joyful, meaningful, purposeful life. And the truth of the matter is, is that you don't look or sound any different now than you did when you came through here as a Christian. And that's the problem, is because when you came through as a Christian, we said, look, Jesus Christ is working through that guy. Look, without the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he loves the poor. Look, like, look. And, and they're like, if, you, if you're the same guy without Christ than you were with Christ, then how can we say that Christ is the, is the, is the, is the magic ingredient? And I think that that becomes the issue is, is that, is that on some level, I, I sometimes ask myself, why is, sec, why is the idea of pursuing love in a secular way so little practiced in this world, like openly? Why are there, why are there no humanist congregations? Why, why are there no great humanist preachers? You know, the last one we had was Robert Ingersoll in the 1890s. Like, where are, like, why isn't this movement? I mean, we have the best narrative of them all. And we have, as we were talking about earlier, the greatest motivation to make our lives about love. And as far as I can tell, the answer is, is that people have defined themselves by what they don't believe in rather than by what they are committed to, by, by, by what they think is wrong rather than by their vision for a better lifestyle. And, and so I, I find myself just thinking, and, and, and every time I articulate that in the world in a winsome way, every, every time I preach love in a secular way, Christian people write to me and go, now I'm pissed at you. Now you need to stop using words like blessing or ministry or fellowship. Those are our words. You know, like, like, who the hell are you to say, you know, that you, that you think that loving other people is the only way to live a meaningful life? Like that's, that, that belongs to Jesus. And, you know, at some point, at some point, when, when, when the secular folks realize that it isn't about, that, 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 that the movement they want to build shouldn't be about not believing in God, but should be about living for love. I think then, then, then we're gonna we're gonna be off in in, in, in a better direction. So, so fundamentally, Bart, we we can Google and we can go Bart Campolo preaching, and we can see some footage from twenty years ago. Um, I'm sure there's some there. I I haven't looked. I saw it in the movie, and then we've got Bart now. Are you saying that fundamentally the Barts are the same twenty years ago and now, just minus Jesus? Oh yeah, because the last twenty years, the last ten years of my Christian journey. I was, I was basically preaching love in this world for love's sake anyway. Like, I, I mean, there was a Christian veneer of it, but like, 
ultimately, I wasn't counting on God to show up and do any magic. My idea of God was God was the idea that we should love each other. That idea is still a good idea. Like that's the ba- like. By the way, evolutionarily, you want to know why we're here? Is because as mammals, we figured out how to nurture our young and develop mutual love and care for each other and build tribes around you know trust and 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 shared values like yeah like i believe in all this stuff this stuff is this stuff is goes to the it goes to the bone like you you can you can go back to the very beginning of time like this this stuff makes sense love makes sense it is it is truly the most excellent way um and and human evolution would be would be a great you know now i don't know how long it'll last we're not looking real good right now but the truth of the matter is, is I have a feeling that somewhere else in the universe, life will emerge. And if it gets anywhere, it'll get anywhere when some part of it figures out how to care about each other. That's the way it's, it, you know, it, it just makes sense. I was like, Rob Bell used to have the same book, like Love Wins. And on some level, I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't know if it wins, but love works. Here and now, for me, love works. It is a better way of life. So I hear you drawing on religion, right? And drawing on the messages of religion, you know, of, of your own, at your own past, etc. So coming back to that dualism and, you know, all these points in between, what role then does religion play? What good does religion do, if any? I, first of all, I don't draw on the message of religion. I draw on the techniques and the language and the rituals and all the forms because the fact of the matter is, is that the evangelical Christianity that swept you up and that swept me up, it didn't win us over because its narrative made so much sense, right? Like, like we didn't come to Jesus because like, gosh, that just, I mean, it's just so logical. We came because the people loved us and the music was good and there was there were mentors and there was structure and there were retreats and missions trips and like there was this there were rituals and songs and all that stuff. And so like Christianity didn't work because its narrative was so good. It works in spite of the fact that its narrative is bloodthirstily bad. A God who says, I love you so much that I will burn you in eternity if you don't accept it. Like it, 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 it makes no, it's, it's, it's a terrible narrative, right? It's a terrible narrative. And it, and, and it works in spite of the narrative because the rituals are so good, because the form is so good. So, if, so like, honestly, you, you dispense with music and mentors and youth groups and, and covered dish suppers and retreats. You, were, you dispense with that at your risk. That, that isn't Christian technology. That works in the army. That works for a, a high school marching band. That works for a, a football team. That like that's that's just what works for human beings. Okay, that's how you keep a tribe together. And so my thing is like I want to I want to I learned all that stuff in church and it was beautiful and I want to use all that stuff in the service of a better narrative, or at least in the service of a better narrative for me and for my friends. If that narrative works for you, stay in church and love people in the name of Jesus. If it doesn't work for you, though, I want you to have a place to go where we've got good music, too, and where we've got, where we've got people hanging around together and where there's somebody who will mentor your son and, and help your daughter get through adolescence and all the stuff that was good about church for us, right? So, so yeah, I borrow. I, I, I borrow. Borrows from, I steal. I steal. Nakedly steal from the stuff I learned in church. Maybe it is dualistic, but I, I don't think of it that way. I just think that supernatural belief systems are memes that once they get started, they get passed on and, and, and they, they take a very strong hold in a particular culture. And, and that's just a, something you have to accept about human, about, about, about civilization. But there's still this central narrative, right? There's still this narrative that the community is built around, you know, and, and in terms of Christianity, you know, it's the, it's the story of Jesus or even drawing back into, you know, the Hebrew Bible and, and, and the narratives that are there as yeah. well. Or if we look out it's a bad to narrative. Buddhism or we look out to Islam, but, but still there's a narrative, right? But there's still a central narrative that, that this is all built around. And so I guess that's what I'm asking 
what's the what's the narrative for humanism what's the narrative for atheism what's the narrative that you're building around is there a central story that you draw people to first or not yeah yeah there is and i mean like i gave a talk on it once like a very simple little talk to 15 people that all the 15 people are like that was the best talk you ever gave you should you should so like i, I got that talk somebody has a recording of it i'll send it to you okay but 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 basically what it boils down to is it starts out by saying if there's one thing we know about life, it's it's that whenever from the from the first single celled organism, whenever life emerges, it has an instinct to propagate into the future. It has an instinct to reproduce or or or, or, or to, to, to it, it always wants to go forward. You say, well, what would happen, you know, like and then it mutates and there are different life forms. But the one thing all life forms have in common is this instinctual desire to keep going. You say, well, what if a form of life emerged that didn't want to keep going? You're like, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stay around very long, would it? Like if it didn't want to reproduce, if it didn't, you know, like it would be like the shaker religion, you know, that, that they didn't believe in sex. And you go like, where are the shakers now? Well, you know, they, they didn't last very long as a, as a tribe. You know, you don't believe in sex, you don't get very far. Um, and so the original value is life. And what makes something good or bad is whether or not it leads to life or whether it protects life or keeps life going forward. And then you study how different it mutates in different ways. So this is just the epic of evolution. Life keeps mutating and all these varieties emerge and some of them make it and some of them don't. And some of them uh, adapt and some of them don't. And, and the adaptation that we end up with is, we end up with this adaptation that says cooperation, caring about each other and looking out for each other. This emerges as a way of life. It emerges not because it is written somewhere or not because it is beautiful to, in, in some abstract way. It emerges because this is what enables people to live. This is what causes them to be able to overcome problems. This, this is an, ad, an adaptation. So that's what I mean when I say love works. It doesn't work for every animal. Lizards don't love. So, so initially, my, the ulti, the, life is the original value. And love is the strategy. Love is the strategy. And what happens is, is that as love emerges as a, as, a, as a life strategy, certain values emerge. So like kids become cute to their parents. And you're like, why is that? Well, evolutionarily, it's really good. If your kid's cute to you, you you'll take care of it more. You're protected better. And, and, and all sorts of endorphins get released when the baby's born and bonding happens and there are all these mirror neurons. And like we could talk for till the cows come home about the science of love and how it works and how human community has emerged. But the fact remains, the, the, the narrative is, is, if you will, is first there was nothing. Then there was a big bang. I don't know why. But from the moment of the big bang, stuff was happening. And then someplace... Emerged the ability for, emerged the conditions under which a single celled organism emerged. And then it gave, you know, I can't tell you how that's happened either. There are all these spots in the narrative that I don't, I, I, th there are gaps in the narrative. But I can tell you from the moment that life emerges, I can tell you a pretty good story of how it got from there, how we got from there to here. Thank you, Mr. Darwin. And if there's one thing that that, that, that the story tells us, it's not that we're moving towards a, lo a perfectly loving future because the fact of the matter is, is that we, we've, one of the things that's really good for life is cooperation. The other thing is competition. Life can always be better, but it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be, there's always going to be struggle. There's always going to be problems, but we love love. And we're by a lot, like, honestly, like, like we're hardwired to love love. We're hardwired to want to make babies. We're hardwired to want to eat food. We're hardwired to want to have sex. We're hardwired to want to care for our children. We're hardwired to want to build friendships with each other. And the truth of the matter is, is the fact that those things are hardwired into me doesn't make me love them any less. And you go like, well, of course you love them, Bart. You can't help but love them. And I go like, I know, isn't it cool? Isn't it wonderful? I love this life. I think this life is amazing. And you go, yeah, but that, that's because you were like determined from, you, you're, you're biologically determined to love it. I go, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm trapped. It's, it's almost as if I was created by something beyond myself and I have no control over it. I'm okay with that. I'm just telling you the story as I've learned it, as I've, as I've learned it, as the evidence suggests it works.
And the question is, like, when you come to an awareness of how it works, which is a very new thing in human history, only about 300 years we've known how it works. But when you come to an awareness of, of how it works, what should you do? What is the correct thing to do when you realize the wondrous process by which you come to be here? And the answer is, you can learn it from any, any religion. You should celebrate it. You should revere it. You should tell the story. But you should tell it in a very specific way. You should tell the story in a way that it inspires people to be more loving and to be healthier and to do the things that will lead to life propagating forward even more. So I believe in love because my deeper commitment is to life itself. And the fact that I know how we got here doesn't make it any less glorious. You know, I've studied a lot about, about human community. And I know that like if you eat together, there's all sorts of Social, social reasons why that bonds people. And if you light candles, people will talk together in a more intimate way. And if you play music at certain points, it will bond them together. And if people move in synchronous movement, they will feel unique. And you can study it all and you can go like, you can take my whole youth group experience and you can explain how it works. And it doesn't make it any less wonderful. And I can do it with my secular college students on a college campus, and I can build a youth group like that with no God talk, none at all. But we're going to sing some songs, we're going to eat some meals, and we're going to do all these things. And I can explain to the kids, here are all the scientific reasons why this is going to end up making you want to be a community, and, want, and it's going to make you care about each other. I'm manipulating you openly. Are you okay with that? And they go like, oh, you betcha. You betcha. We want to be a part of a community like that. I mean, I, you ever ride a roller coaster? It's a, it's a machine designed to to create the illusion of danger. And once you know how it works, you go like, well, I understand how it's working. So if I know that I'm in no real danger, it's not thrilling anymore. And I go like, no, just the opposite. It's just as thrilling and it's even a lot more fun because you're not, it's the illusion of fear, but it works. So I, I go, I buy tickets to movies that I know are going to make me cry. And they manipulate with music and certain ways of cutting the film. And, and I, I pay for the privilege. Like knowing how life works doesn't make it any less mysterious or less wonderful. In many ways, it makes it more so. So, Bart, you say that you, well, you describe yourself as Bart Campolo, a secular community builder. So are you building congregations or are you trying to tap through to existing communities and create a greater cohesion? What does that mean, a community builder? I mean, for me, what it means is I showed up at USC and took five kids that were running an anti-Christian atheist club and said to them like, hey, want to do something different? Let's build a club that's based around like making the most of our lives um, using science um, as, as, as an engine. And they were like, that sounds like fun. And so we started this secular student fellowship on the campus of USC. And it grew into like the biggest, best student organization on campus. And everyone was like, we love those guys. They're the nicest kids on campus. And, 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 and it grew and it grew, not because we were making fun of Christians, but because we were attracting kids who didn't believe in God, but hadn't yet committed themselves to loving kindness as a way of life. And we evangelized them to intentional goodness. Okay. So here in Cincinnati, I came back. I tried to do the same thing on the campus, but the campus doesn't work the same. It's a big university, in a, like, and, and the kids are all commuters, and it's hard to build community there and blah, blah, blah. But I had all these adults who listened to my podcast, and they said, hey, could you start us something like that for us? And so we started something called Cincinnati Caravan, which you could look up. It's, a, it's just a lovely little community and meets on Sunday mornings, and we have an hour-long service in which we encourage each, you know, we play music and we do readings and somebody gives a talk and, you know, we have juice and cookies afterwards. And it's just like any congregation you've ever seen, except this is a group of secular people that are trying to spur each other on to live out our values. And, you know, it's a beautiful, you know, so yeah, when I say I'm a community builder, like, I, like, I'm like the executive director or like the, like I'm one of the like pastoral caregivers of that community. It's beautiful. It, it's interesting, but we, we often reflect 
on the things that we can't leave behind and some of those things that leave you connected into the church community for so long and probably way past your use-by date because it really is, it's a prepackaged happy meal quite often. You do have a prepackaged community. You've got meetings. You've got no need to go outside that bubble. So what you're you're saying there is it, it's a great alternative for people that don't. Feel- Everybody needs a tribe, right? And when you get cancer, who's gonna who's gonna bring the cover, who's gonna bring the meals to your house, and who's gonna drive your wife to the hospital, right? You better have you better have a tribe. You better. And, and the truth of the matter is, is like the people in my in my fellowship, they're not all my best friends. They're all people that share my values, and I see them on Sunday morning. Some of them I only see on Sunday mornings. But like, remember how church was that way? It was nice to have a bunch of people like that, right? Mm. You know, and, some, and sometimes you made really good friendships with that, but not everybody was your best friend, but like it was a group of people who you knew, who you, were, who you, you had an identity with. And if somebody said to you, what are you all about? You could say, see that group of people? See the way we live? That's what I'm about. That's, I'm, I'm one of them. Remember Tara Jean Stevens, she was talking about, she'd heard about this Pentecostal group that was somewhere in, in the US that they were all ex-Pentecostals. They don't believe it anymore. They even give each other words, right? Like they even, you know, it's not God told me instead. It's just like, I think, you know, this kind of thing. And she, and she thought that was really exciting. And I've, I've heard like there's a school of life, for example, there's a Land de Batons group yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, you know, they, they try and do this kind a, of thing. A Sunday assembly. Yeah, there's there's others around the world, and there's even some in Australia, but I don't know that they last because I'm just wondering. And this is why I was asking that question before, and it was just about this this net, this central narrative, this point of faith. First of all, I wonder how many Christian churches didn't last in the first fifty years, because the truth of the matter is, is that when you're starting out a whole new religion, you don't have any infrastructure, you don't have any funds, and you don't have any big churches to support you and you don't have people giving 10% of their income to, 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 to make it happen. So like some of it is just pure practicality. Like we don't have, the infrastructure isn't there for a lot of these congregations to get started. It's hard to do as a volunteer. Okay. So that's one thing. Second thing, and maybe this is even more important is, is that many of these organizations make it their central tenant. So like if the church does it, we won't. So like if they ask for money, we won't. If they have a charismatic leader in front, we won't. If they, you know, if they use emotions to motivate people, we won't. Okay, and 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 the fact, and again, they're throwing out all the stuff that works, right? And so a lot of times, there there are basic things that like any organization would need to get started, and they refuse to do them. Like we're going to do everything by consensus. Well, that, that you can't do everything by consensus in those situations. So, so that's. But I think the third thing, and maybe this is the most important thing, and this is the thing that we learned in Cincinnati and that I learned at USC, is that if you make your congregation about promoting free thinking or about re, you know, promoting reason or about science or about any, on some level, you have to look people dead in the eye and say, this is about love. We're going to love each other. We're going to love, not for the same reasons but we're going to love each other. This is going to be about, we're going to, we're going to take responsibility for each other's lives. And we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to carve out a way of life where we say, look, this may not work for everybody, but these are our values. And we're going to love each other this specific way. And if you don't want to love each other this way, we're not saying you're going to hell. We're not even saying you're wrong. We're just saying you don't belong here. Like, because, because this is for this, this this is a group of people that are committed to loving each other in a particular way, and that's how tribes get built. At some point, you got to draw a circle around each other and say, "We're going to look after each other." And a lot of these groups, everybody wants to meet. Everybody's been bur- half the people that are starting these things are evangelical refugees who had bad experience with authoritarian leadership and bad experience with manipulative stuff, and they're just like, "I don't want to be. I don't want to be tied down to anything, and don't tell me who I have to love." And I, I have so much sympathy for them, and it may take another generation before this kind of thing takes a hold. But in the end, you can't build a tribe. You, you, you can't build a movement without tribes, and you can't build a tribe around anything but love. Not one that's going to last. It's very true, and you know, I, I think that has been definitely one of the bigger challenges since we both. I mean, we walked away in very different ways from our faith. But definitely replacing that community, that love, that sense of purpose, that sense Critical. of belonging. 
Yeah, absolutely critical. And, um, you know, that that is one thing I think that is probably hardest because you, you are given it on a platter. Um, so more platforms that are available would be great. Yeah, and here's the thing, B, is that the reason I was successful at USC was because I had such a good experience in Christianity that, and I, that I left without any damage and therefore I wasn't afraid to use all those things I learned. And so I think the people that are going to probably put these communities together are going to be slightly or lightly wounded, like not so very badly wounded ex-Christians. Um, at least those are, that, that's who's going to make it work in Australia because that, you know, from, in that culture. Um, and, and, and so my encouragement would be this, and, and this is, the last thing I'll sort of say about this. And that is, I get together with four ex-church leaders and we plan these, ca- these caravan meetings. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work because we're building it all from scratch. Coming up with the talks, we, we write them all together. I, I usually deliver them, but everybody writes them with me, like the music, figuring out how we're going to do this stuff. But this stuff is, once you do it, it's so easy to do. Like once you have, the, if you have those tools. But most people don't have those tools. So like, Hey, just because I need community doesn't mean I'm a speaker. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm a music guy. And so what we started to do is we started to like keep track of this stuff. And when people say, I want to do a house meeting, we're like, hey, we'll send you all our meeting notes. Here are the songs that we used. We got them off the internet. Here, here, here's the talk. You, 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 could play the, you could play me giving it or you can just take it and give it yourself. You don't have to write it. Here it is. And, 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 and we're sort of basically saying like, steal. Steal it all. Because honestly, you don't need 50 or 100 people. You can do it with 12 people in your living room. You know, churches did that for years, right? The point is, it's really good to have some place to go once a month or, or every two weeks or however often you do it. It's really good to have something that says, that's this thing I go to where I walk out reminded of what my values are, encouraged and encouraged to live them out. You remember how we would walk out of church and go, no, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to get back to him. I'm, I'm, you know, you get re-energized. We, we all need to be re-energized. We all need to be, we all need to be, we all need to be revived. We all need to be reminded of our values. Lots of us have great values about exercise and eating healthy and stuff like that. That's just mean we do it. We don't do it when we, unless we find a group of people that get together regularly and encourage each other to do it. And whether that's Alcoholics Anonymous or Weight Watchers or, or CrossFit, you name it what it is, there's no substitute for getting a bunch of people together and saying, hey, you remember that stuff that we all think is important? It's really important, right? Yeah, it's really important. Let's go do it again. So Bart, closing thought. You've got a group of Aussie ex-Pentecostals, ex-Evangelicals floating around, listening to two old guys talk about you know, their experiences what would you what would you say to them? What would you leave them with? I mean, I, I don't think I've done like I've been waxing eloquent way too much and not listening enough on this podcast. Um, and and I don't think I've probably done a very good job of communicating how how much I understand, not 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 just through personal experience, but through meeting and sitting with loads and loads of people that are where your listeners are all along the spectrum, including those that are still in the faith, but like trying to figure out a better way to, they want to stay in, but like they can't stay in if they're going to hate gay people or they can't stay in if they're going to send everybody to hell. And so they're trying to figure out a way to, to get Rob Belled up or Brian McLaren up or somehow to stay in the, in the, in, in the evangelical ball game. And I, I haven't done a very good job of communicating that like, I really have a lot of compassion and a lot of understanding of, of all along the way, including being angry and feeling like your youth was taken away from you and that you could have had a lot of really nice, healthy sex if somebody would have just not fucked you up when you were 14 um, and made you think that like you needed to cut your b- back of your wrist with a knife every time you masturbated like I did. And so wherever you are in the spectrum, like I think you guys are doing a wonderful job just by just by creating a place where, where people feel understood and heard and they feel like they're not alone in this. And so my, my, my final word would be like, I get it. And I don't have, like, I, 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 like, there's nothing you have to do um, for me or for anyone else on that level. But I just got to tell you that there comes a moment when the anger wears away 
or it just doesn't, it isn't very becoming anymore. And where you're no longer trying to figure everything, you, 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 you know you don't believe in God. And then you've got to figure out what are you going to be about now? And, and my, only, my only word to you would be, there's, there's loads of meaning and loads of joy and loads of love and loads of fellowship waiting to be maybe not found always, but created. We make meaning. We make joy. We make love by caring about each other. And so I just really want to encourage you that you might say, well, I needed a whole group of people to be a Christian, but I can be a good person all by myself. And I would say, maybe, but I don't know if you can be a happy good person all by yourself. At some point, you've got to find a way to connect with other people and to pursue goodness together. Um, one of my good friends, uh, I, bullshit, he's not one of my good friends. He's a guy I'm deeply in love with and I had one really amazing conversation with, um, is a writer named Johan Hari. He wrote a book about depression and anxiety called Lost Connections. And in the end, what he ended up saying was very much like what you and I, have, what you guys and I have been talking about, is that we're a tribal species and we don't do well behind computer screens and cell phones and disconnected from each other and, and talk, like that we need actual real life human connection in order to thrive mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And so I just really want to encourage you that in a real sense, what you are is you're like being part of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1940s. You're like being part of like the, the, the LGBTQ movement in the 1970s, part of, be, part of being anti-apartheid, you know, you're, you're part of being anti-apartheid in South Africa in 1920. What I mean is like your movement is small. There aren't many of you. You don't even know where to find each other. But you're the future. You're right. It's, it's lonely and it's hard, but like those movements wouldn't have succeeded in the end if there hadn't been people in the beginning who tried and failed to, to put together a little group, who tried and failed to write a good song, who tried and failed to figure out a way to communicate with other people in a way that would draw them in. And so I'm not saying you will all succeed, but what I'm saying is, is that if humanity is going to have a future, especially as it becomes more secular, as fewer and fewer people are able to believe in God, it's going to depend on somebody coming up with a new way of, a new way of being together, a, a new way of creating spiritual growth and spiritual dynamism, spiritual integrity in people. And we're the, we're the ones who can do it. And so I have, I'm full of sympathy and understanding, and I want you to take your time in licking your wounds. But there will come a time, I hope, for each of us when we decide that it's time to get on with the business of figuring out how do we make the most of this life. But that was absolutely fantastic i've got to say and it, and it really resonated and i'm, I'm sure t uh, will comment as well about just how much your stuff resonates and also brings comfort i guess to use some more of those christian words um you know it does bring a real comfort to know that out the other side doesn't have to be a place that you're damned to but it's a place where you can actually find happiness you can find connection you can find love you can find peace um and you can really get the most out of life, squeeze every bit out of it you can because it is so incredibly precious. Yeah, and, and also about showing loving kindness to to Christians yeah. and, you know, not living in bitterness, not living in anger. I think that's really key. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that we've really tried to push through our podcast is we're not angry atheists anymore. We may be atheists, we may be agnostic, we may be whatever, but we're just not angry anymore. Hey, Bart, one really last quick thing is tell people how they connect with you and your work. So if people want to connect with your podcast and that kind of thing, how do they do so? I mean, my podcast is called Humanize Me, and it's on all the platforms. 
Um, and so it's easy to find. It's just humanized me. And, and, and it's, 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 it's usually me talking with some really interesting person who's doing something cool with their life, trying to figure out what we can learn from them and what they're doing, whether they're an artist or a writer or something, what we can learn from them that we can use in our lives to, 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 to do this stuff. Um, so, so the podcast is probably the best, best place to start. And, and, you know, if you want to find anything else about me, it's all at bartcampolo.org. And a lot of times, a lot of times people listen to the podcast and they go like, yeah, all right. I think, you know, something that I need to know. Can I talk to you? And I do, I do, you know, a lot of times people, that's the way to reach me is through, through the, through the, through the website, bartcampolo.org. Then people write to me and, and sometimes we're able to connect them with other good people and things like that. And so if you're out there in this, in trying to, trying to get where we're talking about going, you know, we're all your friends, you know, we're all, we, 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 we like, like there's nothing that gives me greater joy than to, when somebody connects and uh, I'm able to connect them with some, with something else that's going to a book, an idea, a thought that's going to help them move in that direction. So yeah. So the, the, the podcast is a good thing. That movie you guys were talking about leaving my father's faith. It's on Amazon. I think it costs like $2. It's not very expensive. And, uh, it's actually on Vimeo in Australia. We don't have another Amazon over here, but we do have it on Vimeo and it's a dollar 44 yeah. or a dollar 14 or something. A dollar like 44. That. Yeah. Okay. 44 in Australian dollars. So that's even less in the U S I'm just, I'm just really grateful to you guys, um, for, for creating a space for people who have, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are finding a, a real comfort in just in just your guys' conversation with each other, and I'm I'm just really I really am I'm genuinely like thanks for having me. It was, this was really it was really delightful to talk with you guys, and um, I'm sure we'll talk again. We we would love that, Bart. And look, you have been incredibly generous. Um, and you know when T reached out to you, um, you know you responded straight away, and it was like yeah, cool. But why would you want to talk to me? Well, I think it's evident why we'd want to talk to you because there has been such an amazing array of things that you you've covered today and it, it really has been heartening and it's going to leave me it's it's morning in australia um and it's going to leave me with a, a really great sense of of feeling for the rest of the day and of purpose and knowing that you know we can just continue con to connect and that we don't have to actually be seated in our old baggage so it's, it's been a wonderful thing and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you. A blessing on you both. I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, bye. Thanks, bye. See you later.